Liberal government will prioritize significant new investment in affordable housing and seniors' facilities. We'll give cities the money they need for things like Housing First initiatives so we can work to end homelessness in Canada. That was Liberal leader Justin Trudeau in Toronto today announcing his party's plan to increase Canada's supply of affordable housing. He pledged to boost the GST rebate on new residential rental property to 100% for developers building affordable rental housing. He would also give $125 million a year worth of tax incentives to increase and renovate existing housing. The Liberal government would let Canadians dip into their RSPs tax-free for the purchase of a second home in some situations, including moving for work or the death of a spouse. Trudeau also said he'll review the trends behind expensive housing markets like Vancouver and Toronto. Time for the big picture. Bill Robson, President and CEO of the C.D. Howe Institute, Goldie Hyder, President and CEO of Hill & Olden Strategies, and Angela McEwen, Senior Economist with the Canadian Labour Congress. And Angela, I'm going to start with you and ask, uh, let's focus a little bit on the on the affordable housing. I think it's fairly common across the country. I think, I, I mean, I certainly know it's true for Toronto, and I think it's true in most major cities that housing stock, especially at that end of the market, is lacking. In other words, for all the condo building, there hasn't been a lot of new apartment builds, and there certainly hasn't been affordable housing builds. Uh, did what you hear today sound like a solution to that? So what I heard today, I, I don't really think it's easy to evaluate what I heard today. Um, there were promises around RSPs and there were promises around tax breaks, um, but the specific details and dollar numbers weren't there. Uh, there is a problem with affordable housing across the country and the, the broad level statements that he made sounded really good. Um, but we'll have to wait and see as uh, more details come out if that's something that will actually help um, people at that lower end, that affordable housing. And we're also talking about upgrading housing so it's energy efficient at that at that low income rate. And it's yeah. different by province, right? Like in Nova Scotia, a lot of low income people own their houses. In Toronto, they rent. So the answers might be different from province to province on how to best deal with that. Bill, did you like what you heard today? Does it sound like there are some solutions in there to this problem? I recall on this show and uh, in many other forums over the last little while talking about Canada's housing bubble. Yep. And how there is a lot of investment happening in residential uh, construction. Uh, and in fact, just this morning, housing starts uh, got reported at a three year high, a very high number. So um, election campaigns have a funny way of, of shifting the focus. But in general, uh, I'm concerned that this is not a good thing for the federal government to be doing because most of the time we've been talking about ways of trying to cool this off, uh, fearing that there was a housing bubble. If the particular concern is at the low end, um, I still have a problem with the federal government coming in here because the biggest problems uh, when it comes to affordable housing tend to be at the local level. If it were more easy for people to rent out secondary suites and so on in neighborhoods, uh, then we would have a lot more housing stock that would be affordable. The trouble is that people, when they see that happening right in their neighborhood, in their backyard, they tend to go, oh, well, wait a minute, I'm not we sure I that. like that. Yep. And so we're trying to force feed at the one end a problem that really is happening uh, somewhere else. So I'm not happy when I see the federal to get into this territory and I think the election campaign is causing people to say things that afterwards we're going to be trying to undo. That sounds like a, a pretty valid point to me Goldie. This really is, a, it's not even a provincial issue, it's a municipal issue it could, because there are a lot of issues around zoning and the like. Um, having said that, you look to your federal leaders for leadership. Uh, obviously affordable income, uh, affordable housing is an incredibly kind of important piece of the puzzle. Do you want this to reside at that level or would you say no, leave it alone, You're, that's not the right way to deal with the problem? Well, look, I, th I think, you know, in terms of it residing at the municipal level, I think that's the right place for it. We have rules, policies, regulations that ensure that a certain amount of, uh, of zoning is allocated to affordable housing, and I agree with that approach. If it's possible, without sounding like I'm running for office, I, I think both Angela and Bill make very important points, but from a different perspective. It all depends on which uh, syllable you want to put an emphasis on, on the affordable piece or the housing piece, because they're separate issues. Bill touches on the housing and the market realities and the bubble. But the affordable piece is really the thing that I think Mr. Trudeau is after here. He is trying very hard to create a differentiation between him and the other political parties to say, I'm a, I'm a leader with a social conscience and this, the need for social infrastructure is what I'm trying to emphasize here. The issues around housing are separate issues that Mr. Harper and others are talking about, which is, are we subject to uh, you know, foreign, uh, foreign investment here in Canada for housing that is unnecessarily skewing marketplaces at a very local level? And they're very separate issues. And the devil, as Angela says, is in fact in the detail.
Yeah, there are separate issues. I mean, I'll just offer up a little skepticism, Angela, that uh, any federal leader uh, or party can actually solve a mystery that many intelligent economists and analysts and <laughs> academics have not been able to solve, which is what's precisely driving the housing market here. Um, I guess they could track down the flow of foreign funds if they wanted to. But uh, just in terms of kind of, the, uh, to Bill's point, there's a bubble at one end of the market. Uh, to me, a lot of the condos that are being built will be affordable apartments at some point, uh, but not low income necessarily. Uh, what is the way for the federal government to intervene in something that's kind of outside their jurisdiction? Well, that's a really good question because I think the question is affordable for whom? So if you're mm -hmm. talking about somebody who's just graduated from university and has a pretty good job, um, but they can't afford a house, but they want to be able to, you know, live downtown Toronto and be, be environmentally responsible and not drive and all of that. Um, affordable is maybe $1,500 a month, but if you're a retail worker, minimum wage, single parent, affordable is much less than that. And that's the stock of housing that I think we're low on. And uh, Thomas Mulcair and the NDP have also promised to expand that range of housing. I think the Liberals and the NDP have both talked about solutions like co-op housing and um, just expanding the affordable housing stock that exists, so the, the subsidized housing stock. Um, Amanda, you made the point I was going to make, which is uh, we've had this massive construction of condos, especially going on in, in Toronto right now. It's been a headline issue, and in fact, it was one of the big drivers of housing starts just now. A lot of those units are not very large. Uh, they're, they're not like for the, the suburban house. A lot of them are owned by people who are coming into the housing market for the first time. Uh, but some of them are owned by people who have them as rental properties, and this is where this distinction between uh, rental versus versus owned, I, I'm not sure that I'm even smart enough to make that distinction. Yeah. Uh, there's controversy about whether these units are being rented or not. A lot of people are unhappy that so many of them are being rented. I'm saying, hey, this problem looks like it's solving itself. Right. Uh, so to goose it up further, uh, I think it's an election frenzy type of thing. And uh, basically what we've been worrying about, about the housing bubble, I think is still a valid concern. So I'm not happy seeing that get juiced up this All way. All right, we're gonna take a quick break. Uh, this election campaign obviously well underway. What what topics haven't you been hearing about? The big picture says infrastructure should be on the candidates list. We'll find out what else is on next. Well, during this election campaign, some issues have gotten a lot of airtime, including childcare, the aerospace industry, and of course, always jobs. We want to know what topics have been missing in the action on the campaign trail. Bill Robson, Goldie Hyder, and Angela McEwen are back with the, what they think the candidates should be talking about. Um, Bill, I'm going to start with you. What's kind of the top of your list? of what you wish they were talking more about. Uh, they may have mentioned it, but not enough. One quick caveat here. Um, sometimes it's better that issues not come out during the election campaign, because people can say things, as perhaps with housing just now, that you'll later wish you know, they hadn't cemented in a position on. Uh, if, if, if we start to talk about international trade, which I think is an important topic, I bet the politicians would be lining up to defend supply management until the last cow dies. Uh, and we don't want that, because that freezes you in, place in, a, in a place that you don't want to be. Uh, I think it does make sense for us to talk a bit more about immigration in, in, a, in a fuller way than we've done. We've got to focus on the refugee crisis from uh, Syria and Iraq right now, and I think it's appropriate that we should be trying to bring more people in. But there's a lot more to be said about openness and the, and the merits of openness and bringing in people who can thrive in Canada. And when we talked about housing and, and, and there was this suspicion that foreign money was coming in and we didn't like that, well, that's not helpful. I think there's a much better way to talk about immigration in a way that makes people think it's not all about refugees it's about what makes us stronger and makes us better and keeping that political consensus in favor of immigration strong over time all right Angela what would you like to be hearing on the campaign trail so we've heard a lot about infrastructure but I don't feel like we've heard a lot about why you should do infrastructure and what infrastructure what role that will play over time and and we've also heard about the uncertain economy so we've had this really slow this long um, really lackluster recovery and looking forward, we see, you know, an aging population. We, we want to know what we can do about that. And so immigration is one answer that will boost, you know, the working age population and help us uh, create more uh, value in our economy. We want to boost women's labor force participation with childcare. We want to fix our aging infrastructure and our, fix our social safety net, which I think that's what we're talking about when we talk about social infrastructure. And that's like hospitals and schools and and all of that kind of stuff. So like 
why are we doing this and, and what are we getting out of it? And then break down the promises to be able to really pin them down to what exactly is happening in each of these plans. All right, Goldie, over to you for, uh, for what you're not hearing. Well, I, I think in the broad umbrella of competitiveness, I mean, I was going to say immigration as well, but for the same reasons that Bill did, we have to figure out in Canada, how are we going to grow our economy? How are we going to be competitive? How are we going to produce goods and or services that are in demand around the world? And that, those questions take you to where the investment should be made. Politics and elections are largely about the short term. I'm reminded of what Kim Campbell said infamously in 93, coming out of, you know, uh, meeting the governor general. Elections are no time to talk about policy. Now, there may be some truth to that, as Bill said, but the reality is we have some structural issues, we have some fundamental issues, that if you're not going to raise them, including, is there immigration the right number? Should we not be growing our country? Should we not be looking at the Syrian situation and say, if these people are willing to cross oceans and risk their lives, what kind of effort would they make if they came to Canada in terms of setting up their well-being? being for their families and, 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 and getting education and getting their labor training. We need to be looking at those things, particularly in labor markets, because those issues are not going to be gone. They're actually going to yeah. get worse as time passes. We're focused on the short term. I think we need to be thinking more about the long term. Okay, well, let's break some of these down because, Bill, I mean, as you note, things get said on a campaign trail. Uh, when it comes to infrastructure, we have heard rhetoric around it because everybody kind of vaguely knows it's good stimulus and it's an easy way to kind of put, you know, pump money out. What's your reservation about infrastructure? Well, a lot of the time we do cry pork barreling. Uh, the old formula for getting elected used to be, and maybe it still is, if it moves, pension it. If it doesn't move, pave it. And everybody recognized that that was about buying votes. Yeah. Uh, now we're in the election campaign, so we're hearing about how the federal government should spend all this money on infrastructure. There's one thing I don't get. This is kind of a, a perhaps a, a, an accounting or a geeky point, but Infrastructure is capital spending. You don't expense it all at once. So I'm not getting this conversation about the federal government running big deficits. If they're spending stuff on things that Ottawa itself builds, uh, ports, international infrastructure, the things the federal government does, I don't see why you run massive deficits doing that because you're going to write this stuff off over its useful life. Take on the debt you need and match it up. Yeah. If it's all about transfers to the provinces and cities, well, wait a second. Their, their ability to absorb that and spend it wisely in the short run isn't necessarily any better than Ottawa's yeah. until they have an election and want to start paving the roads themselves. So people love to talk these big numbers, but when it comes, and maybe I'm sort of agreeing a bit with what Angela said. I'm not sure. I don't want to put words into her mouth, but we're not hearing enough specific about what you're actually going to be able to build because the feds themselves, they've been spending a lot on infrastructure already. It's not like, well, I, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but the stuff Ottawa can spend money directly on, they've been doing it, and I'm not sure where people are expecting these tens of billions to go. It should go from the provinces, presumably. And the you, cities, but... Additional. But here in Toronto, just to speak, since I'm here in Toronto, we have infrastructure needs. Why should somebody in Fort Francis or New Brunswick pay for that? We should pay for it ourselves. Okay, can I challenge you? Maybe, Goldie, you came closest to this. Um, and that is, if I were thinking about what's missing here, it's something that is visionary and compelling for young people. If you go back and read Barack Obama's uh, primary speech from eight years ago, yes, we can. It's worth a read, by the way. What was so galvanizing about it, it may be disappointing in, in, in the aftermath, but it galvanized mm -hmm. young people. It made a whole bunch of people who weren't even going to vote yeah. say I am now Pierre Trudeau had the same kind of power to even when the message was uh, was awkward or difficult or controversial galvanize people why can't we have more of those kinds of messages you know I'm, I'm reminded as I go through my business planning in our in my day job here about Roger Martin and the winning aspiration I think Canada needs a winning aspiration what do we want to be where are we going to play and how are we going to win in that space but as I've been saying weekly on this panel, unfortunately, our politics has become largely hmm. small ball. There hasn't been a reward from the voter for thinking long term. In fact, I think what we have now playing out here is uh, a larger role for government in our economy. Rightly or wrongly, Mr. Trudeau has come out and said, in order to differentiate myself, I'm willing to run deficits. Now, that's a clear position. Say yep. what you will about what you think about what it actually will do. We're actually in a scenario in which people are now going to be bribed to some extent with their own money. And I'm hoping that this notion of stimulus and infrastructure, et cetera. The role of government should be a transitory role. Our challenge is how are we going to drive business investment and growth in the economy? All right, and Angela, last word to you. We've only got 20 seconds, but uh, on the vision front, is there anything that you think we, we should be hearing? I think we need to be hearing about where the jobs are going to be in the future. What I hear from young people when I talk to young workers is what, what jobs are going to be left for us yep. in 10 years. And uh, I haven't heard that. Like, what kind of economy are we building? It's along the same lines as as what the others are talking about, but more worker focused. What right. are the people going to be doing? All right, that, that's the big picture. Thanks to all of you, Bill Robson, Goldie Hyder, and Angela McEwen.